Hello everyone, welcome to this presentation on Gatling, specifically an introduction to Gatling. Now the Gatling stress testing tool, there's quite a lot to cover in half an hour. Um, so because Gatling is quite, although Gatling is quite a simple tool to get set up with, it's quite complex in its depth in terms of what it can do and the capabilities of the tool. So it will be difficult to cover everything in depth in half an hour, but hopefully this session will give you an overview of what the tool can do and just give you a, a, an idea of where to start from if you're interested in uh, in starting to use it in your project. In the tutorial, in the um, presentation today, we're going to cover a few different areas. We'll start by talking about what Gatling is, some of the features of Gatling. We're going to take a look at the GUI recorder, which is used to record our scripts. If, if we need it to. Uh, we'll look at some test result reports, uh, both during the sort of test results that you get during the test when it's running and also some of the reports that you see, the graphical reports that you see after the test is finished. We'll also be doing a bit of a, an in-depth look at a Gatling script, some very, so starting with some very basic simple template scripts and then building them out from there. And we'll do a live demo as well, running some performance tests against some actual systems at Concur. So let's get started straight away and talk about what is Gatling. So what is Gatling exactly? So according to the official Gatling website, Gatling is a highly capable load testing tool designed for ease of use, maintainability and high performance. Now Gatling is built on top of a toolkit called Acker. Now, you don't really need to know a great deal about ACA, uh, other than it exists and that's it's what's used for gasling. ACA itself, according to its official website, is a toolkit for building highly concurrent, distributed and resilient message-driven applications for Java and Scala, which I've just stolen from here. So why is that important for gasling? The big advantage that this gives gasling, being message-based over thread-based, is that it's able to execute virtual users over threads, over messages, sorry, not over threads, over messages. And because because the virtual users are executed over messages, it overrides the JVA, the JVM limitation of only being able to support so many threads on, e on each machine. This means that Gatling can execute thousands of virtual generators on a single box most other load testing tools, the traditional tools like JMeter and LoadRunner and such like, all rely on a, a thread-based architecture, which means that if they want to scale to many virtual users, you typically need a whole farm of load inject servers to support the load test. With Gatling, that isn't the case. With Gatling, you only ever need to execute your test from a single instance. This this gives it a huge advantage over over other other tools as we're going to see as we'll see in our test in our presentation. Let's move on and talk about some of the features of Gatling. So Gatling comes with excellent support for the HTTP protocol. Now Gatling can be expanded to use other protocols like JMS, but but most likely you're going to want to use it for HTTP and so it's great for testing web applications or it's great for testing for calling APIs directly. It comes with all of the support that you need out of the box for that. that that's where it's bread and butter is, so to speak. The simulation scripts that you write for Gatling are written in Scala. Now, if you don't have much Scala experience, it's not the end of the world and it doesn't matter too much because Gatling comes with a very expressive DSL which makes it a lot lot easier to use and it's you, you simply write your tests in terms of this DSL it makes the test quite readable and easy to understand if you do know some Scala some Scala programming then that can be a real help as well because you can use everything that's in the Gatling DSL as well as any Scala and any Java by inheritance as well um, so it, the more programming you know, the more flexibility you're going to have with your script development. The, there are pros and cons to, to being able to use Scala. So the pros are the flexibility that you have and the complete compact power and control over your tests. The cons are if you're not hugely familiar with Scala, you might find the, the script creation a bit complex. You might be scratching around looking for certain code to create your scripts that will 
make make things take a little bit longer. But overall, I I for me having being able to write tests in SCADA is great, and having that flexibility is huge over other to, other rigid tools like JMeter and, and Load Runner, where you're locked into their design patterns for designing your test scenarios. So another thing to mention is that Gatling comes with a GUI recorder built in. Um, this is an ex an external tool that comes with Gatling, which allow what what this what the recorder essentially does is acts as a proxy. So you set it up as a proxy. You perform your user journey, go to your website, call your APIs, etc., and the recorder captures all of this traffic and then will convert the traffic into a Gatling script for you. Normally, you will need to make some additional edits to this Gatling script. It won't, won't be perfect. It will capture a lot of data, a lot of headers and redundant data, JavaScript that isn't necessarily needed. But it can be a very, very good starting point if you just want to get a quick template script that, that you can build upon and, and, and modify as you need. So one more thing to touch on is that Gatling is very v version control system and CI friendly. So because Gatling is just essentially Scala code, we can it can easy, it can just be kept in the version control system with all of the other production code. That's the best place to put it, and it, it can be updated and so on there. And it's also very CI friendly. So because you can execute tests from the command line in Maven or Gradle or just from the command line app, right? It's very easy to execute performance tests as part of your CI build and because what we touched on in the previous side as well about Gatling being message based again it makes it even easier to run performance tests as part of CI because the performance test can run on the, on the single machine on the Jenkins box itself if you're trying to run performance tests as part of CI for JMeter and other tools it, it can be a bit of a nightmare because you need you Typically, if you want to run any sort of large scale test, you would need a whole farm of load injectors ready to spin up and support the test. But with Gatling, you don't. You can just run it from a single machine. So let's have a quick look now at the GUI recorder in action. So when you download Gatling, it comes with the GUI recorder included. So I'm going to open it up now. So if you're on a Mac, you can open the shell script or Windows will just open the batch file. And so this is what the GUI recorder looks like. Now, the recorder comes in two distinct modes. There's HTTP proxy mode and the hard converter mode. If we run it in HTTP proxy mode, what we would need to do is we would need to change our browser to point all traffic to our proxy on this specific port. This is relatively easy to do, but there are some drawbacks with this approach, mainly due to it's a bit of a faff to set up and it, you can run into problems with SSL certificates. You sometimes will need to generate fake SSL certificates. So the way that I prefer to do it is to record what is called a HAR file, the HTTP archive file. This file can easily be recorded using Chrome DevTools and then you can just export, export that file into the recorder and it will create the Gatling script for you. So that's the way that I'm going to show you now. So. What I'm going to do is that I'm going to open up CTE. This is production CTE. And I'm going to open DevTools, like so. So what we want to do is we want to go to the Network tab, and we want to hit Preserve Log. And we'll make sure we're recording. That's fine. So I'm going to refresh the page, because I want to simulate loading this page. And then I just want to simulate logging into a user account, just to keep this very simple. So I'm going to log into my production auditor account. If I can remember my password. Yes, okay, good. So that's logged in. As we logged in, we can see that we captured all of the traffic here in DevTools. So this was just a simple loading the home page and logging in. So we're going to send extract that now into a HAR file. So to do that, we just right click anywhere and we say save as HAR with content. Call it conquer test, that's fine. I'll overwrite an old one I did, that's fine. 
Okay, so that HAR file now has been recorded. We now go back to the Gatling folder. We'll change to HAR converter mode. I'll flick to my desktop and find the file. I think it was Conquer Test. I'll give it a class name Conquer Test 10 or 1. That probably makes more sense. That should be all I need. So I'm just going to click Start. Okay, and we get the message successfully converted hard file to a Gatling simulation. So our Gatling script has been created for us. Let's open up that script very quickly and have a very, very quick look at it. And it's this one here, Conquer Test 1. So this is what our test script looks like. Now don't be <laughs> don't be scared, don't be overwhelmed with the amount of data that's in here because because everything has been captured, including all the things like Google Analytics data and headers data. Most of this stuff we don't really need for the actual script. When when you learn to understand getting scripts, this will make a lot more sense and you'll get an idea, you'll get a feel of what you need and what you don't need. But this this script, if we were to execute it, should run fine. It should launch the home page and it should log in for us. So there's a lot of, like I said, there's a lot of data in here and we we want to delete a lot of it, but it, it is the skeleton, it is the framework of an actual script that we could then use and, and build out from here if we so chose. So that, that that's the recorder at a, at a very, really high level. The rec you won't need the recorder for if you're just testing an API, for example, I mean, you, you could use it, but it, it, it's often just a good place just to start with if you, do, if you have no idea what your website's doing or what your user journey is going to look like. It can be good to record from here and then have the scripts created for you. So I just wanted you to be aware of the recorder. So I'm going to jump ahead a bit now and just have a little look at what the results look like in Gatling. So there's two types of results. There's the results that you see when the test itself is actually running and then there's the results that the results report that you get once the test is completed so let's have a little look at an example of the results you see when the test is running so this is one of my projects at work for the expense audit service we'll just take a little look at some of the output so Every five seconds when a Gatling test is running, it prints to console an update basically of how the test is going. It tells you the number of virtual users waiting to start, the number that are active and the number that are finished. It then has a breakdown of the requests. This test is very simple. It only has one request. It would also show you the number of errors that have occurred um, and give, give a breakdown of those. There haven't been any errors in this test, so that's fine. Once the test itself finishes, it prints out another relatively short report to the console that has a bit more information. So it again, gives a count of the passed and failed transactions. And then it has a bit of a breakdown of some of the response times. So the quickest transaction was a second. The fastest, the slowest, sorry, was 38 seconds. And then we have some more response time statistics broken down by percentile, etc. We also see a distribution of the response times in terms of ones that took less than 800 milliseconds between 800 and 1200 and greater than 1200. We would also see again a, a, a breakdown of the errors that occurred, but we didn't have any in this test. So I can't show you that here, but that's fine. We might see some of that later on. But the response time distribution here can be customized by changing it in the settings. So you're not locked into having to use 800 by 1200. Everything can be customized easily. So that's the results that you see during the test and straight after. And then that once the test finishes, Gatling also produces a HTML based report. So I'll show you an example of that now. This is what the report looks like. So it's essentially the same data that you would have seen in the text report, but broken down into a bit of a nicer uh, GUI level with some pretty graphs and bits and pieces like that. But the basic data that this is showing is the response times, the various in terms of minimum, maximum, percentile, and the past and failed re uh, responses. So there's a few different charts for the number of requests per second, response time distribution, etc. So this is shown for the global level for all the transactions, and you can also see them for specific transactions as well. 
So one thing that I should mention at this point with Gatling, and it's it's a common misunderstanding when people first use the tool. So Gatling is great at telling you which transactions passed and failed and how long those transactions took. But what it won't tell you is what, what if, if, there are, if there are problems, what's wrong with the system. It isn't monitoring the backend servers. It doesn't monitor the CPU, the memory, the RAM, etc. It can't, it, it, it doesn't have any visibility into any of that stuff. Now at Conquer we use New Relic and so whenever you're executing a Gatling test on your environment you would want to have New Relic set up and monitoring monitoring the resources of the various servers and then use that in conjunction with Gatling. I just mentioned that because it's a common thing that I get asked is how can Gatling tell me what's, what's, where, where the problem is with my slow transactions. It won't be able to tell you that. It's important to understand that that isn't Gatling's purpose. Gatling's purpose is to generate the load and to tell you how long the transactions took and that's, that's as far as it goes. So it's just important to understand that point I think. Let's head back to the presentation. So we're going to have a look now at a very, very simple script. So the script that we looked at that we recorded just now with the recorder is a little bit overwhelming. So let's look at a really, really basic script. So this is a really basic Gatling script that I've written to execute against one of our, one of our endpoints that we use in our test environment. So this script, and like any Gatling script, can be broken down into four simple sections if you will so let's explore them one at a time so section one is where we where we implement the script setup so we execute we can implement we can specify a package again I mean this is that's completely optional you don't have to specify that at all that's just a Java or a Scala package that's nothing to even do with Gatling really we then need a couple of imports these are imports that are required for Gatling to work for HTTP and core and then the most important thing is this this is our class and then we to, in ter order to turn it into a Gatling script we must extend it by this class called simulation so this extend simulation is what turns our normal class into a Gatling script essentially so just three more sections to go if we look at section two this is where we specify the common HTTP configuration so this is configuration that will occur on all subsequent requests in the test. So here we've just all that we've set up is simply a base URL. So this base URL of 10, 24, 1, 150 will be prepended before all of our requests. You could add lots of other stuff here. You could add, add headers and other bits and pieces that need to go into every request, but I've just kept it simple for this example. Moving on, the next part, part three, the scenario profile. This is the actual script itself. This is where the main work of the scripts happens. This is where we specify our actual user journey. So for example, if we were wanted our user journey to be go to this website, click on this, extract this data, wait 10 seconds, do this, do that. This is where it gets specified. In this scenario here, we're simply calling one single endpoint. We're calling this endpoint here, expense audit v1 task. Once we've called the endpoint, we're checking that the status that we get back is a 200 HTTP response status, and then we're just pausing for five seconds. In our test report, which we saw on the previous step, the transaction will be called this, call expense audit service. So if we look in our test report, it, it the the request itself here will be called call request audit service the same here that's what that's what we've named the transaction basically and so that's a very very simple very very simple scenario there just calling one endpoint the final thing that we need to do on the scripts is to set up the simulation so here we've set up a very 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 basic simulation that all of this it does is executes a single user at once so it's strictly speaking, not even really a load test. It's just one user which will execute this journey once. Now you can make as m lots of different other changes here. You can set many, many more users. You could set a few thousand users. You could set users to ramp up over a period of time. Um, you could also set, you could set 
different scenarios. So if you had two, if you wanted to have some users doing one journey, some users doing another, you could add that in here. You can add in assertions here that will fail the test if, for example, the transaction response time goes over a certain threshold or if the certain number of transactions begin to fail, say if more than 10% of transactions fail, then you can fail fail the test here. So that's you would specify all of that stuff in section four. So that's a Gatling script at a very high level. So I think now would be a good time to jump into an actual demo. So here's one that I made earlier, so to speak. So this is the same script that we were just looking at in the slide. So it's a really, really basic script, three distinct parts if you like. There's the HTTP config, which is pointing to this endpoint. There's the actual scenario, which is just going to call this endpoint. So this URL with this endpoint. It's going to check that it's a 200 pause of five seconds. And our scenario that we're going to execute is just one user at once. So I'm just going to execute it straight away from the command line here. So we can, because this is just, it's just, it will execute for you Gradle. We can do that nice and easily with Gradle W, Gatling run. And then we just specify the script name, which in this case is con.conquer.basic.simulation. And that should run our test. So Gradle should go away now and build, build our actual project. This is a very small basic project, so it shouldn't take too long to build. Once the project's then built, it will run this test. It will give us the text result, text report in the console. And it will, it will generate a HTML report that we saw last time as well. So this test is finished. This is our output down here. We can see our one transaction took seven excuse me, 7,651 milliseconds. So not much of a breakdown with just one user. And so that's that's very that's how that works, very simple. We could execute it again for, let's do 10 users, and let's see what happens when we do that. So what this will do is that this will fire 10 users. 10 users will fire at once, and they will execute this scenario just once. So you could set up this scenario to loop five times, 10 times, unlimited times, however you want. In this case, we're just going to loop over once. So we have nine users active, one done. So Gatling is going to keep running until they're all finished. Okay, and so now they all finished. So this time we ran 10 users. The quickest one was 3.5 seconds. The longest one was 10. So there's a bit of discrepancy amongst there. All of the transactions were over 1200 seconds. We could change that to more, or less, or whatever we want. So that, that's a really, really basic load test that we just executed right there. And you see how easy that was. So let's move on and look at a slightly more advanced simulation. So this is based on the first one here, but I've just added a few more features in here just for demonstration. Let me talk for a few of the bits that I've added. So first of all, I've expanded HTTP conf. So as well as specifying the base URL here, I've also specified a couple of headers to keep and to keep the connection alive. So just, just, just for example purposes, I've shown that here. In the scenario, I've changed the scenario slightly. So in the first step, we still call the same endpoint as before. We check that it's a 200 response. We pause for five seconds, but now we make another call to the same endpoint. And for this endpoint, we've parameterized our test data. So you can see in the first one, we've hard coded our test entity here. In our second call, we've parameterized the entity code. Likewise, this, this hard coded one was for the report number in the first, in the first call. In the second call, we, we've we parameterized again to another report number. Let me talk a little bit about those parameters then. So those parameters are what's called feeds in Gatling. And what happens is each time this line is encountered by a virtual user, it needs to get values for the entity code and the report number. So we specified here to feed in entity codes and report numbers. We, we've generated them above here in two different ways. 
So in terms of the entity codes, the entity codes are being pulled from a CSV file in a circular fashion. So this is the CSV file that's got a few entities in here that I created previously. So what happens is that each time this line gets executed by a different virtual user, it calls for a different entity. So that's one way of using feeders. Another way of using feeders without, say, CSV files is that you can use an iterator. So what happens here is that whenever we want to call a report number, we call this iterator, which will then return a map for us with our parameter name, the report number, which is this report number here. And then that's just a random number between 1 and 10. So that's, that's a very simple example of a feeder. Don't worry if you don't quite understand the flow and the syntax. You would need to read about it a bit in documentation, um, blog posts, etc. But that, that's, that's an example of how a test can be parameterized. Another thing that I added to this, this scenario is an additional check as well. So as well as checking that the response code is 200, I'm also adding a regex check here. This regex check is very simply looks for the text entity code in the response. Now you could obviously make your regex as complex or not complex as you like. I just wanted to show you another example of checks that you can do here. You could also add regexes to identify certain data and then extract that data, save that data into a parameter and then use it perhaps into another test. Uh, or another call, I should say, later on. I haven't shown that here, just we could, just to try and keep it a bit simple, but that's absolutely stuff that you can do. Finally, the scenario set up at the bottom, I've changed over slightly. So instead of just executing all the users at once, we now ramp up to 200 users over a period of 30 seconds. I've also added in a couple of extra bits here. So I've set the max duration of the test to be 60 seconds. And also in the scenario, I've changed the scenario to loop forever. So what, what's essentially happening here is that we're going to ramp up to 200 users and those 200 users are going to keep looping and looping and looping until we get to 60 seconds. So there's no, we could specify that they loop five times or 10 times, but it's easier to just say loop forever after 60 seconds end the test. One more thing that we've added in, <clears throat> excuse me, is a couple of assertions. So we've added an assertion that if the global response time is not less than a thousand, for the 90, this is for the 95th percentile, percentile three, which is our third, third percentile in the report. That's a little bit confusing, I know, but if it, the, what it basically says is that if 95% of transactions aren't less than a thousand milliseconds, then it will fail the build. Likewise, if the number of successful requests, the percentage of successful requests is not greater than 99, then we also fail the build. So a couple of little assertions that we've added in here. So let me change this to a slightly lower number just to start us off with. Let's try ramping up to 10 users over 30 seconds and see what happens. So for this test, I'm going to execute from an actual command line just so that we can see it a bit better. And we'll do again, Gradle. Do not use the wrapper? We don't need the wrapper here. Catling run, and then the script name, com.confer.advanced simulation. Go. So again, this will build the Gradle project for us, and it will run our load test with 10 users, ramping up to 10 users over 30 seconds for a maximum duration of 60 seconds. Where have you gone? Here we are. So we're going to get real time statistics as our test executes. So this updates every five seconds. And we can see the number of users is steadily ramping up. We've gone from three active users to five to seven. And we're making our two calls. We're calling the expense audit service the first time and the second time. And we're seeing some errors come back as well. So the expense audit service, because this is 10 users hitting the service relatively hard, we might expect to see some errors or there might be some errors in the test data. So that's good. It's good for us to see some errors in our demonstration. It makes the demonstration a bit more complete. Right, five more seconds and the test will finish. 
There we go. And we get our output report here as well. So the output report is useful for just seeing a very quick high level overview of how the test went. Um, if you're executing a proper test on your production or test environment, you'd probably want to check in New Relic how the test went as well. So we will do that in a moment. Let's run the test one more time and let's ramp up to, let's be bold and go to a thousand users over 30 seconds. So we're really gonna push our system now. I very much doubt that the expense audit service itself will be able to cope with it, but it's fun to break things. So let's try. So another thing to mention is that what you would normally want to do when you're running your tests through CI is to change these numbers to parameters and then just pass them in when you run when you when you run your test. So change change this ramp up users to a user's parameter uh, and then declare that parameter up here and then just pass that in when you run your Gradle or Maven script or run through Jenkins you can then just specify hey for this test I want 10 users or 100 users or a thousand users and then the great thing about that is that anyone can come along and can run a test just they can run a test through Jenkins and say what parameters they want the number of users how long they want it to ramp up to how long they want it to run for how many errors are expected etc etc so as we expected, we're seeing quite a few errors in our test this time. Let's just see it get to the end. It's 40 seconds in so far. Oh man, so ugly, so many errors. I think I'll be in trouble with my team if they know it was me that brought the system down. No, I'm only joking. It shouldn't bring it down, hopefully. Well, we're gonna have a look in New Relic after as well, and we'll see if we can make head or tail of it. So the test has finished. So in that 60 seconds, we executed 1,059 requests. Only 116 of those got through and passed. The rest all failed. The quickest response was in five seconds or so. The longest was in 35. And we had a lot of errors. So the errors that we, the most common error was either a 503 or a 500 in some cases as well. And our build has obviously failed because the assertions that we set for the 95th percentile and the number of success requests have both failed. So let's jump over to New Relic very quickly and just see if we can see any of our data. Now New Relic does take a minute or two for transactions to update so we might not be able to see a great deal. What is this? So when did we execute the test? About a minute or so ago. Ah, I know what's happening. So there, there's actually another test running on EAS at the same time, which got kicked off by my Jenkins job. I'm going to kill that test. If it will let me. Okay, that test is dead, that's fine. So it's, it's gonna be difficult for us to tell the spike on here because there was another test running against the same system at the same time. But that's fine, we can still see some of our data. So this is our spike here, we can see where our transactions went through the roof and our error rate went through the roof as well. Let's see if we can zoom in a little bit more. And there we go, we can see our throughput was just under 750 responses a second. So we get a breakdown of our transactions and our error rates, and we can see our servers were very utilized, 173%. That's not even possible. But anyway, uh, this isn't a new Relic demo, but this is just an idea of how you would use Gatling with new Relic as well. Okay, I think that's pretty much it for all I had for the content. So in terms of further information, there's a few Gatling, plenty of Gatling resources out there. The best place is probably to start on the official site. I do have a couple of blog posts on my own site that I'll send out as well. I have an introduction to Gatling, which is essentially 
this lecture in blog post formats with all of the example code. And I have another quite detailed post on getting Gatling running through Gradle. I've found it more difficult than it should be getting Gatling running through Gradle. And so I produced quite a comprehensive blog post with exact step-by-step -step instructions on how to do it. So running Gatling through Gradle is probably the best way of running Gatling, in my opinion. So I highly recommend you check out this post if you want to know more. Other than that, if you want to see Gatling usage examples in Concur, I've linked to a few GitHub, repodric, GitHub repositories, um, one for the service workbench, one for the expense audit service, which is the endpoint that we saw in this demonstration, and also to the EMT one as well. The EMT one is really worth checking out if you want to know, want to see some advanced Gatling in action. Okay, guys, that's all I had for the presentation. Thank you for watching. I'll see you next time. Cheers. Bye.